Okay, we're live. Hi, this is El Fisherman. Today's February 9th, and welcome to YouTube Live. Lily got it down to a science because I always have problems, and uh, I just press a button and I'm live. So, um, welcome. Um, it's kind of February, but I here outside it's 60 degrees in Baltimore, so I guess we cannot be complaining. We, I think, had a dusting of snow one day, maybe not. Uh, we'll probably get like a foot of snow sometime in March, which will last about 12 to 24 hours. But we'll see what that, if that groundhog was right or the groundhog was wrong. It probably doesn't matter because sooner or later, April comes. So uh, it's also um, a Super Bowl week. So I guess depending who you prefer, it'll probably be a long game with Rihanna on doing halftime on Sunday. I think in the sporting news, the big news is that um, a record that thought was unbreakable, which is the uh, the record for most points by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, was broken last night. And um, so that's uh, – um, it's, it's funny how um, things that have – where if you last long enough, you can break records – they can be broken. The record that will never be broken is Joe DiMaggio's 56 consecutive game hitting streak. I think Pete Rose made it into the 40s. No one's have come closer than that. And the problem is, is when you need to do it every single day. Now, Kareem Jabbar's record was based on uh, the fact that um, uh, longevity athletes take care of themselves and uh, – can last longer and so you don't need to do it in a short period of time you can just wear it out but certain streaks you know the Bay Ruth was uh, broken in part because of steroids perhaps you would say but the Joe DiMaggio you can take all the steroids you want it ain't gonna help and that 56 game hitting streak and many of you probably don't know some of you do know that the day he um, broke the streak the guy who played third base, I forgot what team he played against, um, made like two or three terrific plays that stole hits. And then DiMaggio, I think, went for another 13 or 15 games. So if it wasn't for that one guy, he would have had about a 70-game uh, hitting streak, which is just astounding. So anyway, let's talk about coronary calcium scoring. One of the studies that we do when we talk about screening in radiology, we talk about mammography, we talk about virtual colonoscopy, we talk about lung cancer screening. One that's commonly used and is used more and more is calcium scoring. Some insurances do pay for it. Some people pay out of pocket. When it's out of pocket, it's typically in that $50 to $75 range. It's a non-contrast study. It's a low-dose study. And what you're trying to do is detect the presence of calcification. Now, calcium scoring studies, you flip back about two decades, Arthur Agustin, famous for the South Beach diet, an incredible cardiologist, preventive cardiology, was really the one who focused on the presence of calcium being a marker for coronary artery disease. Yes, from the Framingham studies, we had many risk factors for coronary artery disease, but they never really worked all that well. They were good, but not good enough. Calcium scoring was better. And calcium scoring is simple. The presence of calcium is correlated with the presence of plaque and coronary artery disease. The higher your score, the more disease you have, and the higher your risk of a heart attack. Now, several things I need to say. One is, Although the best score that we all want is zero, zero doesn't mean you don't have any calcified, you don't have any plaque. First of all, we talk about plaque being calcified, which means it's over 130 Hounsfield units. If you have non-calcified plaque, it's less than that, and so you wouldn't score it. So you can have a score with zero, but have a lot of plaque, but it's not calcified plaque. That's one. Number two, we found this out in Dr. Lai's trials which were doing cardiac CTA screening in high-risk patients from the African-American community in Baltimore. But one of the things we found out was that sometimes I would see patients with zero scores, but really high-grade stenosis. Someone eventually wrote an article, not from here, that in African-Americans, a zero score 
is not as good as a zero score in a white patient. That you can have a zero score and still have critical stenosis. So one of the things we know with the limitations of calcium scoring are that sometimes you can have a zero score. People, in fact, thought the scoring system was so good that they use it in the ER setting. So if you came in with chest pain, if you thought about coronary disease, they would do a calcium score. If the score was zero, they would stop there and say, okay, you don't have any coronary disease. Obviously, we know that's not the case. Calcium score is a non-invasive uh, triage type study. It's kind of like cholesterol values, it's like blood work. It's really very basic, but it can be used as a guideline for managing patients. We see more and more of these studies ordered by the internists, not by the cardiologists. Cardiologists do, of course, but by the internists, when you're seeing a patient, maybe for the first time, you don't want to do calcium scoring every year, but you, when you're working a patient up just for their basic baseline, you do calcium scoring. Now, what calcium scoring is very good is giving numbers. Obviously, we all want zero. As I mentioned, zero does not mean you don't have coronary artery disease but it's as good as you could do. Then the question is you go up the ladder. All of us know that we've seen scores in the 3000s. Now, as I mentioned before, sometimes you're gonna have a zero score and have a high grade stenosis. Sometimes you have a score of 3000 and no stenosis because it's kind of like the coronaries of pipes and the pipes are densely calcified. People have done work looking what's more important, the score, or the number of plaques, or the distribution of plaques. A lot of work is going on trying to look at that. AI is being used, trying to go beyond the score and see what other information you can have. So typically we say zero is the best score, no plaque. One to a hundred is a small amount of plaque. May require some lifestyle changes, maybe statins. Some people say one to 10 and then 10, 11 to 100 as dividers. Between 100 and 300, that's a higher score. Uh, the question is, what do you do? Just medical treatment? Do you need to do more invasive studies? Do you need to look harder? Should you do a coronary CTA, for example? And then over 300 is a higher risk. Again, it's not absolute. And again, distribution of calcium. 300 in one vessel, is that better or worse than 300 spread around three vessels? So there's a lot of stuff we kind of know, but we don't know to the depth we need it. I think AI is going to help with that. We also talk about when you do calcium scoring, you know that you do a non-contrast CT. When you're doing a coronary CTA, you do it before the coronary CTA. Well, one of the things people are working on, and particularly with AI, is the ability to do a calcium score, an accurate calcium score, in patients who've been given contrast. We you subtract the contrast, and now you have a virtual non-contrast and new calcium scoring. People have spoken about that for years. It's never really worked well, but there's a lot of work going on, and I think you're going to see that. We also do mention to our residents, fellows, and faculty that when you look at a, a chest, look at the coronaries, even though it's not a calcium score and you're given contrast, mention the presence of calcification and extent. We're not doing a score, but you know, minimal, you see a little bit moderate and you see a lot particularly those patients with lots of calcium, if they haven't been worked up, they should be worked up. So again, when we scan a patient, we talk about things that can be used, opportunistic screening. We scan you already, but now we can look at the coronaries, we can look at the, the sub-Q fat, the intra-abdominal fat, we can look at the muscle mass, we can look at the lung, lots of, look at the aorta for calcifications, lots of things we can look at. So the calcium scoring thing becomes very important. Now, remember that the calcium scoring is a pretty simple procedure. Again, it's low dose, so you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to do one every year. There's a question of how often to do one. One of the challenges that patients who are put on statins, right away, the score is not going to change, and the score may keep going up for a while, and then maybe a plateau, so people then will worry more uh, some people say, well, get a score every couple of years. You don't want to get it too early because not much is going to change for better or for worse. Now, in terms of calcium scoring, some people would argue everybody should get a calcium score, and that's probably the right answer. But patients who are of increased risk, 
patients who are diabetic, patients who are older, patients who are obese, patients with family history of cardiac disease, patients who are overweight, smoking, do not exercise, all of the uh, high-risk patients, perhaps they're the ones should be getting calcium scoring routinely. Though again, many people will say everyone should get calcium scoring. Some people argue 45 or 50, some people even say 40. It's a tough call, but it's something that can be done and is being done and I think uh, will have a major impact. Now, obviously, as we said, the best study is a coronary CTA, but only a small percent of patients who get calcium scoring go on to coronary CTA. But again, it's a very strong tool, calcium scoring, used correctly, and it's part of your cardiac workup. It's not the only thing you're managing a patient on. You're looking at the lipids, the cholesterols, you're looking at everything else. Now, sometimes for the patients, when they see calcium, they kind of get a little bit upset and they're more careful about taking their medication. So sometimes it's a good uh, thing for the cardiologist or internist to show the patient the scan, and then they tend to get a little bit charged about making sure they take their medication. So there's a lot going on there. I I think what I'm going to do is put together a talk on calcium scoring and some of the important features from the ACR, from the AAC, and just some medical societies looking at who should get calcium scoring, why you do it, what should you do with it. And I think um, it's, it's something that you will be doing more and more of in your practice. It's easy to do. It's easy to read. Again, the computers are getting better in doing the scoring. As a radiologist who reads the studies, you have to look at the images to make sure someone doesn't make a mistake. I think the biggest mistakes are giving a too high a score because you kind of put in calcifications from the aorta rather than the coronary or a valve that's in place or something else, including a stent. So I think as a radiologist reading this study, particularly whether a score is zero or 3,000, just give a quick look. Make sure you don't see anything obvious. Uh, surely in the higher scores, make sure there's no bleed in of something else like the aortic valve or a stent to the coronary artery. Sometimes the text will miss it. So with that, let me stop there. Let me thank everybody for their attention. Let me thank our entire audience on YouTube, which is a big, big audience. And I'll see you next week. Bye, guys.